You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. We also want this training program to give you an opportunity to learn more about sex offenders. I attended the program today so I could take back information for myself as well as fellow officers about the investigating of people charged with sexually based offenses at the federal level. It's also difficult for the victim to see it as a sexual crime. We at the Federal Corrections and Supervision Division feel that this is an important issue to be addressing and that we have made it a priority at the AO. I think this training will teach us to uh, do better pre-sentences, number one, to start the process, and secondly, will help us supervise them by knowing what kind of conditions to impose and knowing more about the offender himself when he's released for supervision. The client is the community, or the community is the uh, client. Um, so I may be treating, we may be treating an offender, an individual, but that individual may not be my primary client. We've always heard about this program at Butner, but now we've actually been here and have had an opportunity to see the staff, meet the staff, see the program, so I think it's going to give us a lot of insight into what goes on back here and how we can continue that in the community. Welcome. This special needs offenders program is a focused edition in this series featuring the Sex Offender Treatment Program at the Federal Correctional Institution in Butner, North Carolina. In June 2000, nearly 100 pretrial services and probation officers participated in a workshop at the Federal Correctional Institution in Butner. Sponsored in part by the Federal Judicial Center, the seminar was presented by the staff of Butner Sex Offender Treatment Program. For two and a half days, the program's director, Dr. Andres Hernandez, and his staff trained officers on a variety of topics, including an overview of sex offenders and the treatment program at Butner, a sex offender-specific PSI, and risk assessment and supervision. So much material was covered in those two days that we couldn't adequately cover it all in one two-hour broadcast, so we divided the program into two parts. Today is part one which begins with an overview of sex offenders and the specifics of the Butner program. The part two of the series will pick up with a sex offender specific PSI and continue with risk assessment and supervision techniques. Now if you're interested in learning more about standards of assessment and treatment, let us know through your evaluations. If there's enough interest, we'll consider developing a third installment in this series. Dr. Hernandez put together a wealth of information and supplemental reading materials. Most of those materials, along with a complete slide presentation, can be found on the DCN. Other materials referred to by Dr. Hernandez can be found on the website for the Center for Sex Offender Management, and their web address is www.csom.org. Let's start with Dr. Hernandez and the warden of FCI Butner, Stephen DeWalt. Let me once again uh, welcome you to our program entitled uh, effective management of sex offenders in the community. This was a project uh, that was uh, several months ago just an idea and I'm so glad uh, to have you uh, here. It's, it's now a reality. We have an excellent uh, program or what we believe is an excellent program for you. We have a lot of information to, uh, to share. Uh, we also want to hear from you. Uh, certainly you have a, a wealth of knowledge and expertise that uh, uh, we need to benefit from. And I hope uh, today we, and, and, uh, and tomorrow we can have an exchange of information uh, between uh, our two agencies. Before I move on, I wanted to introduce our warden. Uh, warden Stephen DeWalt has made uh, uh, certainly this uh, uh, training conference uh, possible. These uh, training materials uh, certainly are possible due to Wart, uh, Warden DeWalt's uh, support. So without uh, further, further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Warden DeWalt. Good morning. Uh, let me start off by saying that I want to welcome you to the Federal Correctional Complex here in Butner, North Carolina. One of the nice parts about being a warden and about being a supervisor is to be able to have the bragging rights with the kind of folks who have put together 
through uh, their professional expertise a program of this type. I think you will find that as you go through the program over the next day and a half, two days, that they are going to request a lot of feedback from your point of view in reference to this program, referencing issues, referrals, how it can work. This will help support us as we continue to go forward with the Bureau of Prisons executive staff on exactly how this program is going to work. And again, welcome to FCC Butner. Thank you. I, want, I have a lot of material to go through. We're going to be talking about uh, sex offenders. Now, when we uh, refer, and when I refer to sex offenders, I'm going to refer to criminals. Okay, so uh, by definition, anyone who has committed a sexual crime is uh, a sex offender. I frequently get uh, questions, uh, uh, some fr from probation officers, some from uh, you know, other individuals, uh, and, and the question goes, well, this person was convicted of child pornography, possession of child pornography. Is he a sex offender? And my answer to that is yes, he, he has committed a sexual crime. Okay, so see, the, these are some of the more traditional crimes, sexual crimes that we encounter in our practice. Child molestation, abuse, assault, rape, indecent exposure, masturbation. These are the more traditional crimes. Now, in the federal system, we tend to see an overrepresentation of a group of inmates, uh, primarily comprised of child pornographers. These are people who uh, engage, uh, as you well know, in, in, uh, in uh, distribution, traffic uh, of child pornography, downloading child pornography from the internet, um, using the uh, U.S. Uh, Postal Service to uh, get these materials or introduce them uh, via U.S. Customs. Uh, so these individuals do end up in our uh, jurisdiction, in our prisons, uh, and they tend not to end up in state uh, systems. We have uh, this other group of uh, criminals. These are children, uh, individuals who lure children uh, through the internet uh, and who travel across state lines with the intent of committing sexual abuse of a minor. Individuals who uh, pander, uh, these are the panderers, uh, individuals who engage in, in, in traffic in uh, child prostitution. Not those who engage in it, but those who profit from it. Uh, recruit uh, children. Uh, groom children to, uh, and sometimes abduct children to engage in this type of uh, activity. We also have uh, a group of criminals who are very uh, sophisticated about what they do. Uh, these individuals uh, engage in, in the, uh, what's called the child sex trade tourism. Uh, does anyone know what that is? And has anyone encountered uh, these uh, cases? Have you heard of uh, pedophilic organizations uh, setting up uh, tours in overseas? In Mexico, certain parts of uh, uh, South America, Central America, Southeast Asia, uh, in, uh, in certain parts of Europe, to uh, go, go for the explicit purpose of sexually abusing children. There are some pedophilic organizations in this country who sponsor orphanages. In, uh, in Southeast Asia. And uh, the uh, sponsorship is for the exclusive purpose of having access and quote unquote right to sexual abuse, uh, uh, those uh, sexually abuse those uh, children. So this is a, a very, it's an unknown, uh, largely unknown type of criminal activity. It's very sophisticated, but it has, uh, as you might expect, profound, profound consequences on an entire system that is affected by it. And, and, and we also have murderers who can also be classified as uh, sexual offenders if the murder uh, was sexually motivated. So these are the more unusual type of sexual crimes, but nonetheless, these are quite uh, prevalent in our system. All right, so who are they? Who are these uh, uh, individuals? Uh, again, by definition, they are criminals. Um, this in, in individuals may or may not be paraphilias, uh, paraphiliacs. Now, paraphilia refers to a psychiatric 
a group of psychiatric diagnoses. Para means deviant or away from normal. Philia means sexual attraction. So these are all those disorders, all those individuals who may be considered sexually deviant. Now some sex offenders may have a paraphilic disorder and some individuals with a paraphilic disorder may not be sex offenders. A diagnosis of uh, paraphilia does not require that the person engage in criminal sexual behavior. So these are, th there is a considerable overlap between paraphilias and sexual crimes, but these are not synonymous categories. So I, I want to highlight uh, that, uh, that issue. These are some of the uh, paraphilias that are listed in the uh, DSM-4. This is the uh, diagnostical, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. Pedophilia. Many child molesters are pedophiles. Many child molesters are not pedophiles. Or I should say, do not meet the criteria for pedophilia. Many rapists are sexual sadists. Uh, many rapists are not sexual sadists. Many child molesters are pedophiles and sexual sadists. Exhibitionism, voyeurism, these are people, the peeping toms. And the catch-all category, not otherwise specified. That is when we don't have, when we haven't made up a, a term, a diagnostic uh, label for uh, a paraphiliac, we make one up and say not otherwise uh, specified. I've seen some pretty creative uh, diagnoses uh, such as pictophilia for child pornographers. Now, uh, there is no such thing. It, you know, people just came up with that term, pictophilia. Um, I think it's a profoundly erroneous category, but we'll leave my commentary for later. All right. What do these uh, people have in common? What uh, common characteristics uh, do they have? There's a large study, a very large scale study that was uh, conducted over an eight year period. And this is the uh, primary author, Gene Abel, and his associates, Judith Becker and a bunch of other people, over a, uh, an eight year period studied a group of 561 sexual offenders. These are adult male sex offenders. Now this was the, uh, probably the first study of its kind in, in which they ensured, uh, assured the, uh, the inmates anonymity for self-report. Again, 561 incarcerated male offenders. These are some of their demographics. Uh, the range of age, 13 to 76. So really spanning the whole um, age range from uh, teenagers to uh, well advanced in, in age with a median, uh, pardon, an average age of 31.5 years. They were, for the most part, moderately educated. You know, these are, so you can say this is not a function, se sexual offending is not a function of low education, low socioeconomic uh, status. In fact, 40% uh, of these individuals had at least one, one year of college. Now in the federal system, particularly with uh, child pornographers, uh, this uh, certainly holds up and we probably see a much higher uh, percentage of individuals who have uh, high educational attainment, uh, achievement. Uh, individuals who are physicians, who are college graduates, um, individuals who uh, are in law enforcement. A uh, number of individuals that we get in the federal system have uh, uh, advanced degrees. All socioeconomic and eth ethnic uh, groups, again, not representative of any particular one, these 561 were pretty much um, from all socioeconomic and ethnic uh, groups. I do want to mention something. In, in the federal system, we have a, uh, probably an overrepresentation by instant offense of Native American sex offenders. But that is by virtue of uh, the type of crimes and where those crimes are adjudicated. Uh, but about 49-48% of all instant offense sex offenders are Native Americans. In this uh, particular sample, about 50% were married. Now this kind of shoots down that uh, uh, myth that sex offenders offend because of lack of opportunity, they're not, you know, they're not having sex, uh, they, they are socially incompetent and cannot 
be part of a uh, relationship with uh, another adult. Well, in fact, um, over half were involved in a uh, quote-unquote meaningful adult um, intimate sexual relationship. Now this is a very good point. The majority of these uh, individuals reported deviant sexual interest prior to age 18. I can't tell you how many times I've been confronted with cases of individuals who at 48, at 52, at, 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 at 69, suddenly have an attack of pedophilia. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Uh, sexual interest prior to 18. Prior to 18, that's when most, uh, most of us have already de uh, developed our sexual arousal patterns. And for a person to say, look, I I've never done this before. I've never been attracted to a child. And here you find in their possession 10,000 images depicting child pornography. That, that doesn't add up. So this is a, a very important finding. Another important finding is that these individuals engaged in the behavior multiple times. All too often we get these uh, individuals saying, I did it only one time, only once or twice, or as many times as they have been caught. Well, it, that doesn't happen. These individuals engage in this behavior multiple times and they accrue many, many, many victims. This particular sample accrued 100, over 195,000 victims. This is a significant number. Now this is a number that is skewed by high frequency sexual offenses, such as uh, exhibitionism, such as voyeurism. Nonetheless, even when you take all of those high frequency sexual crimes out of the equation, this is a very, very significant number. Uh, if I remember the uh, data set correctly, there were only 53 child molesters who targeted boys. They reported over 20,000 uh, victims, uh, just that uh, subgroup. So what are the uh, implications of uh, research like this and, and other similar findings? What I'd like for you to remember uh, from this is sexual deviance often begins at a young age. It is seldom that a person will have an attack of pedophilia at 42. That doesn't happen like that. Sex offenders engage in multiple paraphilias. It is seldom, and I'll talk more about this, it is seldom that they, ga they engage in only one type of criminal behavior or deviant sexual activity. The instant offense is the tip of the iceberg. Again, pretty much the same. And finally, sex offenders are a heterogeneous group. It's a group that uh, is representative of everyone. Those who are poor, those who are rich, those who are in between, black, white, brown, red, all, soci uh, all socioeconomic and educational uh, uh, achievement. All right, this is consistent with data that we have collected and SOTP stands for Sex Offender Treatment Program and I'm going to use that acronym uh, over and over again. Uh, I came on board um, and, and took the uh, position of Director of the Sex Offender Treatment Program in January of 1997. Since 1997, we've treated more individuals than uh, 93, but in this particular study, we only looked at 93 individuals uh, that have gone through the program. Some have uh, completed the entire phase of the program. Some have been expelled uh, from the program because of uh, a wide uh, variety of reasons. Some of these people are still in the program. Okay. We have or we typed uh, four groups in this uh, particular sample of 73. Child pornographers, those who engage in this uh, luring and travel with intent, that's my sort of catch-all phrase for those who 
uh, target children, try to meet up with them, travel across state line with the intention of sexually abusing them. Those who engage in, in contact sexual crimes, this may be child sexual abuse, rape of an adult woman, anything that involves a contact sexual offense. And then other. Uh, others, uh, these are individuals who uh, are in for uh, uh, drug-related offenses, bank robbery, uh, not that many, but... So these are the numbers of offenders in each group. 39 uh, being the largest group. Yes, sir? Since this program is volunteer, what incentive is there for the individual to volunteer to participate in this program? None, except treatment. So this is a, a, a unique uh, population. Um, they do volunteer. Now, some of them say, yes, uh, you know, doctor, I want treatment. And when they actually get here and we put them through the treatment program and what it, it, it entails, they say, well, no, no I, I really don't want to participate in this. We have some of that. There are very few who actually complete the program. Uh, and those uh, individuals need to stay motivated and need to, need to endure the process of treatment. It can be very grueling sometimes, you know, coming up with a, a victim list a victim list that they don't want to admit to themselves, let alone to others, to the probation officer, to treatment providers, for fear of uh, uh, prosecution and, uh, and, and other consequences. Uh, I'll talk more about the admission criteria and who actually makes up this uh, group of people. Okay, these are contact crimes admitted to before treatment. This is based on PSI information, based on psychological evaluation reports that we have received. This may also include information regarding uh, self-report. So these are not just convictions for contact crimes. It may include self-disclosure to you as the PSI writer. After treatment, that means after they complete a, a victim list. This is self-report only. Very few of these people have uh, been polygraphed. So child pornographers, people who are seen frequently by the court as not very dangerous offenders. Actually, this particular group had the highest number of contact crimes, 925 offenses. Very significant. This was, I believe, a fluke. Had we had a higher number, and maybe there is some sampling error here, but I, I do expect, I would have expected this number to have been much higher than it was. From 42 to 228, and these are just uh, three individuals admitting to uh, uh, contact crimes, and then that jumps to 30. Again, a total of 1,197. Okay, these are individuals of the uh, sample of 63 in, in the uh, total sample. There were a group of 32 individuals who had no, absolutely no contact crimes. So this is about, I would estimate, about 40% of our sample had no known history of contact crimes based on the PSI. Of this group, in, in this group, there were 25 child pornographers. That's a very typical case. Person gets uh, uh, caught for trafficking, possessing, downloading child pornography. They don't have a criminal history. They've never been picked up as sex offenders before. Group of 25 five with the travel with intent, and two in the other category. These people admitted to committing 429 contact crimes. Now, uh, what's different about this and the other data sets that I presented, the other data sets included non-contact sexual offenses, exhibitionism, voyeurism, frottage, um, and in other uh, contact crimes. This is, in this uh, particular 
data set, this only includes contact victims. These are actual people that were victimized by these alleged not very dangerous offenders. So these people are quite busy. This is, uh, again, uh, the same data set. Um, the uh, larger, uh, uh, largest representation is uh, child pornographers and contact offenders. Most of these are Native Americans. Another uh, graphic uh, dep uh, depiction of uh, disclosures, uh, an increase of uh, 1,000, over 1,000%. 1, uh, Again, the, this is the overall number of 73 offenders. These are the uh, child pornographers, contact uh, crimes, the luring and travel with intent, and the other category. I hope you can take these slides and, and share them. I, I, I hope to soon publish uh, these uh, data. There is no data out in the field that supports uh, what we have uh, found. Uh, this is a unique program because we have a unique sample of sex offenders. There are a lot of people, so-called experts out there, offering their opinions about uh, cyber sex uh, criminals, and, and they know very little about what's, uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, they're offering opinions based on their gut feeling, their clinical impressions, and what they see is they see a highly educated man without a, pr a prior criminal history. Uh, they, th there is a lot of similarity between the offender and everybody else in the criminal justice system. Uh, a person who's quite uh, good and sophisticated about deceiving and manipulating others and no criminal history. So the natural tendency would be for clinicians and others to form that opinion that these individuals are really not that dangerous, that uh, somehow it's the internet's fault or you know, some uh, devious uh, child molester who was sending the child pornography and these people were kind of helpless victims. Well, what we discover is that while some of these individuals may have um, pedophilic tendencies and the internet is a viable uh, mechanism or medium uh, whereby they can further that interest and then they get caught for it. There are plenty of individuals who use this, uh, this medium to actually further their already existing sexual deviance. It's unfortunate at this point we don't have a classification system for um, child pornographers. I hope over time to develop one. Um, my advice to you would be share this information. This is, uh, this is public information. There is nothing uh, uh, here that identifies uh, identities. Uh, I, I am more than happy to talk to anyone who will listen to me. So any other questions? What about people who are in the BOP for, say, a fraud conviction or drugs but have they have prior state convictions, child molestation, are they eligible for this? Uh, I'm glad you raised that issue because it goes to what I'm going to talk about next. Um, we have approximately, uh, about six months ago, we had about 1,500, maybe 1,600 sex offenders who are serving time for a sexual offense in our system. So that's, uh, that's a little, slightly more than 1% of the entire population. We have about 130,000 inmates in our institutions. So it, it comprises about 1%. These are instant offense sex offenders. The others, we refer to them by their public safety factor. And this is an assignment that uh, uh, inmates receive upon their initial custody and security classification. This enables us to identify them, flag them as sex offenders in our system, and yes, they are eligible to participate in the program, even if they have had no sexual convictions, and they knock on my door and they say, Doc, I'm a pervert, I'm a sex offender, I'd like to participate in your program, and in fact, we had one person like that, only one though. Uh, that's, that's a very rare uh, occurrence, and, and a few months ago, I didn't uh, think that that was even possible. Uh, but uh, this guy um, uh, certainly disconfirmed uh, that uh, belief. They are eligible, and let me talk about 
those numbers. Uh, these numbers uh, refer to everyone in our system who is a sex offender. Individuals who are uh, serving time for a sexual offense and individuals who are labeled as sex offenders or flagged for a previous conviction. I, I should also mention that uh, none of these uh, numbers here include sex offenders who target prison staff and who target other inmates. That's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a big population, uh, but we, we don't know much about uh, that population. We are, we've been in the process of studying that population and developing specialized uh, programs for them, and I'll talk more about that uh, tomorrow. How many sex offenders do we have in the uh, BOP? Well, 1% is, is the uh, instant offense uh, sex offender. And then we have probably another 4%, 4%, yeah, about 4% who are public safety factor sex offenders for a total of about 6,000. Now, these data are from February of this year, and we had a total of uh, 5,500 and some uh, offenders in the uh, sex offenders in the BOP. Now, by region, uh, you may know that the uh, Bureau of Prisons is divided into six regions. We are in the Mid-Atlantic uh, region. Now the number with uh, the highest number of sex offenders is the north central region. Right here, 1,362. Rate of increase. Um, uh, I've had uh, brief conversations with, uh, with some of you and you have certainly talked about the number of cases, the increase in the number of cases that uh, you see through your districts. Well, we've also seen that. In, in fact, in the past two years, we've seen an increase of uh, 45 percent. Only two years ago, uh, our total number was about 3,800. Now we are probably, this is six months old, we're probably at about 6,000. So this number is increasing rapidly. Why is it? Um, I think there are, there are a lot of reasons uh, for, for the increases. It has to do with um, special legislation, uh, and uh, not legislation, but funding for the prosecution of some of these crimes. You may have heard of uh, the FBI's uh, sting operation, the innocent images uh, operation. That has produced uh, a number of prosecutions and cases filed. Uh, we are becoming a, uh, a nation that is uh, increasingly um, literate of the internet and, and we're using the internet more and more. Uh, we have now mechanisms where people can police the internet and these type of criminal activities uh, through the internet and report it to a central uh, location. This is called the cyber tip line. It's a co congressional uh, initiative. It's done through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children along with FBI and other law enforcement agencies. It's a very important tool and uh, which has produced in only one year 460 arrests. This is from uh, a little over 2,000 reports. And these are citizens uh, just like you and me uh, who are on the internet and have come across this uh, kind of garbage on the internet and, and do report it to the cyber tip line that goes directly to law enforcement. Any questions? Uh, let me open it up for uh, maybe a, a 10 minute uh, uh, a session of uh, questions and then we'll break. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you were saying that you encouraged the polygraph, but then you said the 73 people you were talking about, most of them hadn't had that. Do you use it on a regular basis here? Or? We would like to use it on a regular basis. Uh, it took me almost a year, a year and a half to get it approved. Then it took me a while to find a vendor and then it got too expensive. So now I'm trying to recruit a psychologist uh, from the Northeast uh, who is not only a good psychologist, a good plethysmography uh, examiner, but he's also a polygraph examiner. So as soon as I get him on board, if, if he's uh, willing to come, we'll be doing a lot of polygraph examinations. Can you talk a little bit about what your opinion is that are the important variables that are getting these guys to disclose the information? I know the tool, like sexual history questionnaire and the polygraph, but what do you think is occurring in the offender's mind so that the disclosures are increasing as they go along in the treatment program? 
I guess that's a multifaceted process. It has to do, first of all, with their baseline motivation. By virtue of them uh, participating and volunteering for the program, there is some degree of motivation. They want to get better. Now, for most of them, if we just went on what, they, uh, what their conviction was or what's on their record, and we assume that that is what we're dealing with, and we didn't actually delve into the sexual history and the victim list as much as we do, they would probably be very fine with that. They wouldn't volunteer any additional information. For many of them, it's very difficult to come to terms with their sexual offending history. They have a great deal of emotional energy invested in seeing themselves as not very dangerous. They have lied to their spouses, their children, their parents, their brother, sister, everyone about their criminal history. And there is a lot at stake. Now, what gets them to uh, actually disclose and begin to talk about uh, these issues? I think it has to do, number one, with the treatment community. We have uh, systematically shaped a therapeutic community that is very powerful, has a very powerful and insidious effect on disclosures. The predominant value in the program is honesty. So there is incredible peer pressure to come clean, put all the cards on the table. We do a great deal of motivational interventions. Tell them, look, unless you do this, you're going to be continue to hide and maintain secrets and you're not going to get any better. We explain to them that sex offender treatment is not about just sex and deviant sex. It's about a lifestyle, about a lifestyle of irresponsibility, a lifestyle uh, of manipulation, deceit, a lifestyle of uh, hedonism, a lifestyle of egocentrism. And we try to impact their lives at that level as the context for therapeutic intervention, as the context for specific cognitive behavioral techniques, relapse prevention techniques. Because without that context, these interventions can get quickly lost. The peer pressure in a group setting is such that the offender will come in and say, yeah, I only did this. And he's now 47, and they all look at one another and say, yeah, right. You've only done this once. Uh, you're not attracted to uh, children. So there is pressure, systematic pressure. We also work with them individually, as well as in the group setting, to, again, motivate them. We're not looking for self-incriminating information. And in fact, when we've had them uh, polygraphed, I specifically have told the polygraph examiner do not elicit identifying information because that is not the purpose of treatment. The purpose of treatment is to, assessment and treatment is to have an accurate account of what they've done. I'm more interested in finding out their, the full magnitude of their deviant sexual behavior than, um, than the identity of their victims. Now, if it's a child victim, I'm bound by law to report that to authorities. And there have been two cases in which I, I have had to do that, call a law enforcement agency in the uh, location, the jurisdiction where the offense uh, occurred, where I have the identity of the victim, and I have the location of the uh, victim, and I have made that call. And the offender, the program participant, has been fully aware of that. So there is an understanding that I'm going to be straight with them, and they're going to be straight with me. I'm going to hold them accountable, and I will not accept dishonesty, and I will not accept deceit. Now, I, I hope that gives you an idea of what is the climate in which treatment occurs. Um, sometimes I'd like to believe in my own narcissistic uh, mind that I produce, uh, you know, these uh, changes. But, you know, these people sometimes come to us ready to change. And uh, we are 
at the right time, at the right place, with the right people in expertise, and we're able to capitalize on that. Uh, these people are not without uh, serious uh, reservation, uh, reservations about reporting the full magnitude of their behavior. Based on criminal history, based on the PSI, these people may be very low risk offenders. But gee, after they report 93 victims, uh, and they report a predatory style of, of sex offending, you know, sometimes I think that, uh, hey, they should be locked up forever. Um, we still release them. So, yes, ma'am. At some point down the line, um, is the BOP considering making your program mandatory for sexual predators or offenders who have actually had um, con uh, sexual contact with children? I mean, do you think that, that you'll be moving in that direction at some point? At this point in time, there is no talk about making the residential sex offender treatment program a mandatory component. There's been some discussion uh, with uh, myself and the uh, psychology administrator for the Bureau of Prisons, um, making, uh, having a similar model of treatment uh, as the drug abuse programs. In other words, developing what I would call a psychoeducational pretreatment module uh, or class that would be mandatory, uh, a, a type of program that uh, is similar to the 40-hour uh, drug and alcohol education class that we currently have, um, and, and that have, uh, have something similar for sex offenders. Now, that has many implications um, in terms of cost, in terms of uh, identifying sites uh, for that, uh, and we are at the preliminary stage, uh, but we are discussing it we, we certainly recognize the need to do more. Okay, take a, a 15 minute break uh, and uh, we'll see you in a few. You heard Dr. Hernandez talk about presenting the sex offender treatment program study in November. Well, that study has been presented and Dr. Hernandez provided us with an update of the data and analysis, which is also available on the DCN. Now next, we'll move into the specifics of the sex offender treatment program at Butner, but like Dr. Hernandez just mentioned, it's time for a short break, so we'll be back in five minutes.